Hello and welcome to the webinar on this election week. This is the One Voice Public Policy Monthly Report uh, webinar. This is a production of PMA and NTMA. I'm Caitlin Sickles. Um, I'm at the Policy Resolution Group at Bracewell. Paul Nathanson, also from Bracewell, will join us later in the webinar. And the webinar will be led by Omar Nashashibi um, from Inside Beltway. There's much to cover, as you might imagine, here on Election Week from Washington. Uh, our two teams here are both the on-the-ground lobbyists um, here for NTMA and PMA and also uh, Paul and I do public affairs and, and strategic communications for uh, both associations under the One Voice banner. Uh, much to cover about uh, the election results, of course, but also the impact for manufacturers. And uh, though the um, we will spend some time thinking about the new administration and the new Congress. That doesn't mean uh, that there's nothing to report that's happening now, because certainly things are still happening as in these waning days of the 118th Congress and the Biden administration. So we will talk about that as well. Uh, this webinar, there's so much more content than we really get to in the time. And so um, these PowerPoint slides are really um, this this slide really tells you everything that's included in this deck and do uh, feel free to find it and download it and look for all of these specific topic areas that we may not cover in in um, too much detail today just for the purposes of time so do uh, find that deck and um, look for the information you can find it both from pma and ntma and on the one voice info website if you're looking for that um all right so, Omar, um, we, you and I were just recently together at the NTMA Engage Conference where we looked at lots of different scenario plannings for different uh, possible election outcomes. But now the election outcome is known. Uh, the former president, is President Trump, is now President-elect Trump as he sets to return to the White House. Um, I will turn it to you to tell folks a little bit about what they ought to know about the election results. What were you watching for? What did you see? Um, I'll go to you. Well, and back and forth, too, as well. Like, sure. You're right. We just sure. recorded our podcast the other day. And a lot of this is let's look back to one of the slides we did have in some of our previous district chapters and then engage meetings where we did have one where we envisioned a scenario where Donald Trump had 312 electoral college votes, and That's we might right. actually That's be there. That's the point. If you show people a lot of different scenarios, you're bound to be right. And here we are. <laughs> That's right. We learned from our mistakes, Caitlin, in 2016. <laughs> As we looked at the map, though, it was one of those scenarios where she struggled across the board, struggled in Michigan, in, in Wisconsin, in Pennsylvania. Many of us did feel that there were some challenges there. The trend lines do show that she's also potentially going to lose Nevada and Arizona. And just a few of the takeaways from how we got there. And I think now the final turnout numbers, Caitlin, are coming in a little bit higher than 152 million. But you have to adjust for population. We're still at lower turnout for this election cycle than we were for the last one around. But most importantly, it seems that Harris lost in virtually every demographic. She lost, uh, oh, she underperformed Joe Biden in virtually every county in the entire country, except for a handful that's out there. But really, when you take a look at some of the voters that were there, Trump did increase his share of non-white, non-college voters. He did win a majority of Latino males. Harris only won women by nine points. Clinton won her by 15 points, and Biden won women by 11 points, the the black voter is, is something that they did come back a little bit more than some of the polling was there, but she underperformed in that space as well, Caitlin. So it's all these different demographics across the board. It's very difficult for somebody to win when you're dropping in some of these key demographic areas. I think that's right. I mean, I think there we can look at it two different ways, right? You can look at um, she, uh, um, Kamala Harris underperformed Joe Biden um, among key demographics, but also uh, Donald Trump improved his performance with nearly every demographic group nearly everywhere. And so um, it's not just that she underperformed, although that, of course, is a factor, but it is also that he um, significantly improved his standing, uh, which I think... Um, 
turned out to be the the really defining factor um, in the campaign. I think this slide that you have is really interesting um, and certainly let you speak to some of the details. But one of the thing that I think is um, interesting was, you know, the fundamental reality for her that was the challenge from the start is that it was clear from Biden approval numbers um, and the, you know, sort of always key indicator of do you feel like things are getting a right track, wrong track, right? So if you have 70% of the country saying they're on the wrong track, then you it's clear you need a change candidate. And it's very difficult to um, depict yourself as a change candidate when you are part of the sitting administration. And that was always going to be a challenge um, for the Harris campaign. And certainly the results indicate that they just were not able to make the case um, that she represented change. Um, certainly not sufficiently enough. And and he, uh, he being Trump here, really was able to articulate a change message in, a, in an effective way. And I think that is also another really important factor. No, you're absolutely right. We talked about this even over the summer, is that she had to be the change candidate and they had to make it a referendum on Trump. Well, right out of the gate, the Trump folks for the first six weeks really worked to define her before she had the chance to define herself. So now it ends up looking like Trump is the candidate of change. And that's really what a lot of voters wanted. But I think you're right. she just could not outrun Joe Biden, especially for voters where the economy was the number one issue. When two thirds of the voters rate the economy is not good or poor and 70 percent say the country is on the wrong track. It's really tough. I mean, Kayla, not to turn this into a podcast, but I've, I've been thinking about this, too. Could any Democrat have beaten Donald Trump or did it really matter? So everyone's looking for somebody to blame. Is it Joe Biden because he didn't get out too early? Is it because the candidate herself didn't run a great campaign? I think she actually did run a fairly good campaign. I just don't think you could change the voters' minds on the economy and the price of eggs, the price of gas, the price of milk. So do you think any Democrat could have beaten him? Or was this just the economy was going to be hung around any Democrat, no matter who it was? I think that the postmortems will tell us more. But... In this moment, it seems like it would have been challenging probably for any Democrat. But what we, the piece that we don't know is had Joe Biden gotten out earlier, had he said that he wasn't going to seek reelection, had there been a a true primary, well, I shouldn't say true, had there been any primary system on the Democratic side there might have been a candidate who emerged through that process that was able to depict themselves as a meaningful change candidate because they would have had the opportunity to articulate a distance. For her, I think it proved virtually impossible because threading the needle on, mes on messaging there was incredibly difficult. Now, had she had more time you know, she had to run a 100-day campaign. Had she had more time, maybe she could have. Had she performed a little stronger on some of the questions about, you know, I mean, we sort of have that infamous quote where she went on The View and said, you know, I, there's nothing I would have done different. I mean, I'm sure the Harris campaign wishes they had that one back. So could anyone have done it? Maybe, but not with that short amount of time. What she did with the time she had was was probably about as well as she could have performed, absent a few kind of notable slip ups, but it probably just wasn't going to be enough no matter what. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you, too, on that, especially she just wasn't early on, wasn't willing to criticize Joe Biden. She didn't create enough separation between herself and this current administration in which she serves. And that obviously was a very difficult task to ask of anybody and that they needed to distance themselves from Biden. As you take a look that not until really the last week of the campaign did Harris switch and start talking about the economy. She had been focused on Trump. And we saw this in 2016 that you can't just be against somebody. You've got to actually be for some issues here. So we're going to continue to go through a few more here. We just wanted to flag a few things on states and especially on the turnouts. You know, in Michigan, we talk about the African-American vote. Black votes in in the actual city of Detroit, 47 percent turnout. 
that's just incredible. And if you look at Dearborn, where he won, Trump won by six points, Kamala Harris underperformed Joe Biden in the city of Dearborn, Michigan, by 36 percent. Jill Stein got 18 percent of the vote in Dearborn, Michigan, which is the highest concentration of Arab American voters in the U.S. So even in Michigan, she really had some struggles in some of those key counties. And, you know, Wisconsin, Caitlin, that's another one where looking at the, the black vote and the economic message that Trump was putting forward seemed to be seemed to be working. Yeah, I mean, it's clear that the entire blue wall states, you know, the so-called blue wall states, um, the the message from the Harris campaign did not penetrate as effectively as the message from the Trump campaign. I think that the early indicators are what you're suggesting, which is that ultimately it came down to pocketbook issues. Um, that's certainly a part of the puzzle. Um, I think there were also a number of ads run, significant financial spend from the Trump campaign run on social issues. Um, and it's yet to see, you know, with the postmortems on the of the campaign, whether those move the needle, whether it was the economic issues, really ultimately can we decipher in the end, um, economic issues and, and social issues may not ultimately be as as different as maybe a, a um, Democratic campaign has always believed them to be or has has in recent history believed them to be. So I, I think it's probably too early to know exactly what moved the needle in any given state. Um, but certainly it, what is true is that the Trump messaging um, eroded into the share of Democratic voters in in the blue wall states and across the country. I think you're right. I think the, before we jump over to the House and the Hill right now, I think the final takeaways will be the economic message resonated with women in particular that are most on the front lines of looking at cost of a household and also with minority voters. And I think social issues really help motivate those infrequent voters that let's just describe them as 18 to 35 year old white males. And that combination, I think the Trump campaign got to some of those key points, immigration, saw some of the trans ads that were flooding in certain states, in certain targets, they really did micro, micro target uh, in some of these folks to, to get them out. And they spent the last two years doing that. Uh, but let's let's touch on right. the hill. And, yeah. and the postmortems will dive a lot into into how those that advertising moved the needle. And for those of you who live in those states, you certainly saw the airwaves blanketed. Uh, and so I think there'll be a lot of discussion about how if and how those were effective. Yes. And as one of our listeners just texted me, no, I cannot use those terms to describe what the Democrats did, but it was summarized fairly well in that text message. Uh, we did want to flag a couple things here for the House of Representatives in the United States Senate, and we take a look at where we are on some of the races. Again, we try not to get too political on this uh, on this webinar. We're going to shift over to the regulatory and the policy issues at about uh, 1225, so in about 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes. But we did just want to flag some of the results in terms of the Political Action Committee donations that One Voice, the NTMA, and the PMA have been giving to elected officials and candidates to support uh, your causes and your industries. So far, we do not believe have any losses for any of the candidates to which we donated. Everyone so far is on track to win. We've got a couple out in California, and I think one up in Maine. We're still hanging on to see where they uh, where they where they all fall down. But just a pretty good record in terms of how we're we're spending your money and the political action committee efforts to get members of Congress that understand your issues is ongoing. But let's just start with it and. Caitlin, I feel free here again to, to jump in into some of these cases when it comes down to the U.S. Senate. I think the final numbers are probably going to end up being 53 to 47 is my guess. Uh, Pennsylvania got called, obviously, after we put this deck together. Um, I think that Arizona, we know that's going to be Democrat. Nevada, I think she, the Democrat hangs on there and Jackie Rosen. And so I think that's how we end up at, at 53, 47, which is a very, very good night for Republicans to capture the Senate and give them some cushion, not only in legislating, but also when it comes to 2026. So, Caitlin, I think in some of these places, we yeah. knew it was going to be tight Michigan and, and Wisconsin. So, I mean, I'm thinking back to our, our presentation at the NTMA Engage Conference. And I mean, this uh, flip in the Senate, we were both fairly confident was going to happen. I think um, sort of that was the uh, Washington intel, at least. And, you know, I mean, I think this is here's why this was a predictable outcome. 
you had senators holding on to seats um, in states that have been going red increasingly uh, for a long time. And I'm thinking there of Sherrod Brown in Ohio, uh, John Tester. I mean, it's really hard to swim that upstream against that kind of red tide. And so eventually that caught them and and you know Tammy Baldwin in Wisconsin managed to eke out uh, her victory there. Um, so you know I I think that was a a known outcome. I think what you're identifying, you know, giving them cushion for legislating is certainly true. The other thing it gives cushion for is the s confirmed Senate or, or, or you know uh, nominations that require Senate confirmation. So that's what what you guys are all hearing about in the news right now. The Trump transition team um, identifying who might be in cabinet positions, who might be in other key industry head positions. Um, one of the challenges, if you have a really close Senate, in terms of getting people through is that confirmation process. If you get a reasonable cushion there, like we're looking at, it certainly makes it a lot easier for a Trump administration, second Trump administration, to put through, you know, who who are their favored folks for those uh, confirmed positions. Now, that doesn't mean they have a rubber stamp. You still have a Susan Collins, you have uh, Lisa Murkowski, you have the incoming senator from Utah who, you know, they're, they're maybe not going to be totally aligned with the administration, but it's certainly an easier world than had for them than had they had a, a tighter um, margin. And that, you know, that's certainly, like you said, a big night for them. Yeah, absolutely. You take a look at some of those key races that we've got right here, and these are the ones that we narrowed down. Obviously, all 100 senators are relevant to manufacturing, but we thought we'd take out a few of them. Uh, we think that Jim Banks, with whom we just held an event for NTMA and PMA in Indianapolis on October 4th, he's now going to be sworn in as the next senator here shortly. Uh, actually, just got invited to go view the uh, Tyson fight up on the hill with, with Senator-elect Banks. Uh, he's up here, uh, not just because he's from Indiana, but he's very close to J.D. Vance. They have a common background in the way, in the way that they grew up. And so he's going to likely be a conduit there. We saw Michigan, Melissa Slotkin, that's replacing Debbie Stabenow, eat one out there against Mike, former Congressman Mike Rogers. Sherrod Brown, whether you're Republican or you're a Democrat, uh, I'm in Ohio, I just saw the Roman Chucks uh, about two hours ago or so. And so whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, Sher Brown was a workhorse, and he was a workhorse for manufacturing, maybe not always for your issue, but he, that's one of those voices that, that industry is gonna actively be looking to replace, particularly on the Democrat side. That'll be important to do. Uh, Pennsylvania, I think David McCormick is gonna come with uh, hopefully a little bit more energy and activism than we've seen for, there as well. And as you said, Tammy Baldwin was able to hang on as we take a look at some of those that are out there. Uh, the key committees that are gonna come out will get a little bit more into policy issues. So this is more for your reference when you take a look a little bit later. We've obviously worked with many of these members for many years and a couple instances uh, for a couple of decades now. So one voice will be very well positioned now that we've got an outcome over on the Senate side to be able to move forward, whether it's on taxes, trade, or funding for projects that are out there. But Caitlin, you know, it's still not there yet on the House. I think it's the Republicans are going to hold it. That's kind of the trend line that you're getting from folks in your shop too, I would assume. Uh, that's right. So we, I should mention here that uh, Bracewell does a post-election analysis. Um, it's posted online, and I can certainly share a link around to it. Um, also, guest appearance. I, I promised you all that Paul Nathanson would join this webinar, and he is here. I am here. <laughs> So uh, while we're we're tracking the House uh, side, and uh, we think that the Republicans will come out with about 222, which is, you know, um, pretty much what they had bef uh, before they started losing a few seats. So we think that they're going to eke out a majority in the uh, in the House. Well, wow. so but is it a governing majority? Because we've no. seen what happened this time. <laughs> it is not a governing. I think you're going to continue to see some of the. Uh, chaos that you've seen over the last four years. I, uh, Omar, I think you, whether it was this this close number, whether you're it's Democrat, obviously it's a huge difference if it was a Democratic House, but it's it's going to be the same ungovernable House as it was before, I think.
Well, and so that's why I put on somebody here from Bangor, Maine, for, for Jared Golden. Uh, Jared Golden's just hanging on. The problem there is if he drops below 50 percent, he's at 50.0 right now. That's a Democrat running in a Donald Trump district if he might have to go for a runoff there. But I put Jared Golden on here because he swore that if he gets reelected, he's going to resurrect the Blue Dog Caucus. And that was a caucus of Democrats that are fiscally conservative and socially moderate and the Democrat Party needs something like that right now, and they're really struggling in their messages. So you'll see a couple other tight ones were still on David Schweiker. It looks like he should be okay, but all those West Coast states you saw on the previous slide, those are going to continue to take a little bit of time for those to, to mature and for us to get the final results on there. But Schweikert's on Ways and Means. That's something that we're watching fairly closely out there. Uh, we, Democrats did not do well in Pennsylvania. They lost a couple of seats out there in Matt Cartwright and in Susan Wilde. Those are a couple of active members in the education and CT uh, career and technical education space. And uh, Marcy Captor still seems to be hanging on for her 40th year. But those are a couple of the a handful of the key races that are out there. And again, uh, not, not to presume that Republicans are going to maintain the House, but it does look as such. So the relationships, uh, for example, I was on a phone call yesterday with Raja Krishnamurthy. He's that top Democrat on the China committee that two weeks ago was on a call with the Ways and Means Committee staff director that handles all tax and trade as part of being in their personal uh, campaign donor program where I donate to the chairman personally. So we've got great contacts on both sides. Either way, we just need to get the House settled. And again, back to you all at Bracewell, looks like we've got a leadership election meeting coming up November 13th. So it sounds like Republican leaders are pretty confident. Democrats, their leadership meetings, looks like it's gonna, elections are going to be December, uh, excuse me, November 19th. Yeah, I mean, so, I agree. I think it's pretty, uh, on the, the Senate leadership side, uh, at least according to the media reports today, that uh, uh, President-elect Trump was pretty clear on his opinion of uh, Senator Scott running for leadership, which was a hard no. So, yeah, I think that's that's kind of what we're we're waiting to see. And there's still a lame duck to go through, but this gives you a little bit of sense of what's going on on Capitol Hill. Uh, again, this this webinar is probably going to run till about twelve forty-five or so as we go to the complete. But in the next five minutes, we just want to round out some of the election results and what we believe that the impact here is on, on public policy. So again, uh, Paul and Caitlin, feel free to jump in, especially on some of the energy environment and some of the trade and, and tariffs and, and some of those issues. But we'll try to run through quickly again for folks. This is obviously gonna be for reference for people to be able to take back. But the big difference between a Democrat and a Republican is seen no more clearly than when it comes to regulations. We have a couple things going on. I'll quickly explain the Congressional Review Act. Some of you have heard us talk about this before. The uh, Trump administration used it. The Biden administration used it. Trump, too, will use it again. This allows a Congress to block a regulation from taking effect if the regulation was finalized within roughly six months of legislative business days. That means that as of Anything that was finalized by the Biden administration after August 1st of this year is likely eligible for Congress to hold a vote, which is just a simple majority in both chambers, and have Trump sign it. And if you do and successfully enact a Congressional Review Act on a final rule or regulation, it bars the agency from bringing back that rule in a substantially similar form which means that has a long-term impact. We will certainly be very, very active in this space as one voice and also as working with some of our, our colleagues and uh, our other lobbying partners up on, on Capitol Hill. What we are also looking at from these areas, the overtime exemption rule that's currently going through the courts. We are also taking a look at uh, a few other areas that we think that potentially the Trump administration could come in while the January 1 date is still solid right now for the overtime rule. They could come back and retroactively possibly change that there. The OSHA third party worker walk around, that's going to be an easy one because Trump already reversed it when Biden, or excuse me, yeah, when Obama put it in place and then Biden came in and then redid that again. Uh, a few other areas that we're also really focused on, indoor, outdoor, heat rule. There's no question that's a top priority. One voice, we have a working group that's right now going on. And that working group has been able to gather a good amount of information. As a reminder, OSHA is looking to create an indoor, outdoor rule to regulate the workplace when the heat index reaches or exceeds 80 degrees Fahrenheit. 
And that is obviously quite problematic for many of our manufacturers. Although I just toured an NTMA shop this morning that was air conditioning, it's kind of cold in there, but it's still noticed that they're OSHA is taking a one size fits all approach when it comes to that. And that certainly is going to be one that's going to be subject to either slowing down or reversal. So these are examples of some of the rules and regulations that we could possibly see that are affected there. Uh, but Paul and Caitlin, you had a couple of, of I think webinars, you, especially the good one, the long one this week, there where you all discussed the election outcomes on energy and some of the EPA regulations and what you're expecting there on staffing. I think this group would benefit from some of that insight as well. Sure. So um, a lot, a lot of what we put in the or mentioned in the webinar uh, you have here on the slide. Um, but I'll hit a few key points. One is uh, President-elect Trump on the campaign trail this time has talked a lot about uh, the IRA and you know his displeasure with some or all of it. Um, I think that given the our IRA's uh, champions. Um, who are Republican members of Congress, um, a full repeal of the IRA is unlikely. Um, this is my opinion, but it's also the opinion of uh, our colleagues here who really work on uh, that space every day. Um, Scott Siegel, Tim Urban, you can, uh, in the webinar link, which I'll share, you can hear more from them in depth. Um, they are expecting to see, you know, industry organizations doing a lot to try to educate uh, members of Congress, especially incoming members about the uh, economic uh, benefits of those tenants of the IRA, uh, particularly those that have, um, you know, strong uh, projects and, and plans in Republican held districts. So expect that. Um, you know, I think also some of the other things that, that we all might expect, you know, um, more of a focus on legacy fuel production. Um, I think that, we should anticipate that the transition toward clean energy continues. It is not so much. Those kinds of decisions have, while presidential administrations sort of come and go, there are prevailing market forces that make a lot of those decisions. So we should expect that, you know, progress toward clean energy projects will, by and large, continue. That being said, we will see, I think, an integration of more legacy fuel sources as well into the um, larger portfolio because maybe restrictions that you might have anticipated under a Harris administration now will not uh, be happening. Um, similarly, I think on these uh, climate policies, we may see a shift from the Trump administration, which would certainly call into question, you know, the the U.S. position on climate issues and our uh, sort of stance in in leadership on those issues. So, you know, I, I, he's he said that he's going to withdraw from those agreements. We'll see whether that happens and then whether his that decision then becomes policy. I think it's probably too early to tell on those. Yeah, I think, I think that's right. And especially with the, the drill baby drill kind of issues and increased fossil exploration, even though my understanding private sector is less focused on federal lands as they are on state and private. So you'll see a lot of quick quick activity there. But just one last on, on those regulations, though, it's important to keep in mind that many of them are going to be subject to legal challenge. And so whatever Trump does, particularly in the environmental space, we expect states such as California's environmental groups NRTCs, Sierra Club, and those folks to file lawsuits that could either drag, slow down, or uh, impact in one way or another the Trump administration's efforts on in the regulatory space. A couple things on on workforce that we just want to want to mention in here is on registered apprenticeship programs. That's something that we've been dealing with for some time. This administration's been trying to do away with a competency-based program for apprentices. We file extensive comments on that. We expect that final rule to probably come out sometime, I would argue, between Thanksgiving and the new year by the Biden administration. And that's something that will continue to go on. But overall, when it comes to workforce, expect additional funding to go straight to the states, usually in block form and giving more flexibility to the states. And this is an area that we will continue to be working with the Trump White House on when they come in. Uh, just the last two areas we wanted to touch on on policy, and then we'll continue with our regularly scheduled program on rules regulations for the month that came in October, is on, is on taxes. Uh, this will 
take a minute or so, uh, maybe just in the interest of time, Paul, if it works for you, I'm going to jump to trade and then I'll go back to taxes because I know you've got to hop off. So, Bracewell, do you want to just jump in here on on trade with Trump since we know this is going to be a day one kind of exercise with the, with the Trump administration? Uh, sure. So, look on, you know, we're in the era of continuing to have the era of tariffs and more so with the Trump administration than a Harris administration, although a Harris administration would have not been a tariff free world anyway. So, um, but um, I think the thing to emphasize, I want to emphasize a couple of things. One, on steel and aluminum tariffs, I mean, as you recall, those tariffs were originally um, uh, applied by the Trump administration. I am not sure you're going to see a huge difference, although you may see the uh, end of tariff rate quotas with the EU, UK, and Japan. Uh, we're certainly not going to get a, um, uh, I think, for American proposals for a Green Steel Club, but, uh, you know, the EU's top priority is their CBAM program, which is which continues. Um, but you will, um, you know, that 25% tariffs for steel will stay in place and 10% for aluminum. Um, I think that uh, President Trump views that these, and I think the Harris, the, uh, Harris administration would have said the same thing as the Biden administration, that those tariffs have, quote unquote, been a success. Uh, and so you're going to see um, probably large increases in tariffs on China, um, both using 301 and other mechanisms. Um, Trump has, you know, has threatened much higher tariffs. And I think that is going to be a, a focus of bipartisan agreement as far as taking further actions on China. Um, I, uh, the other point I wanted to make was the executive branch has a lot of flexibility when it comes to applying tariffs. Um, there was uh, an article yesterday, though, about um, the Trump, uh, the incoming Trump administration trying to work with Congress to have them uh, for the first time in 100 years uh, build in tariff increases into legislation uh, that would uh, be part of the large tax reform, the tax package that has to be passed. Um, so that was just one possibility. There's a lot of uh, obstacles uh, to that, but we'll see what happens. Um, I think the point, Omar, and I'll turn it back to you. Well, uh, one point you could, I'll, I'll leave USMCA because you talk about that a lot. I'll leave that to you. But one point is, just because that there's going to be tariff increases, that doesn't mean there's nothing that can be done if you are uh, part of the global supply chain. It just means that, and I'm sorry, I think the, vice, the president or vice president's coming by our office here, but um, it just means that your supply chain will continue and even more so run through Washington, D.C., um, and that you need to be here and you, as far as you need uh, to communicate with your elected representatives through one voice and uh, with uh, policymakers in the incoming administration, because there are ways to uh, minimize tariff impacts or to ensure that the tariffs that are applied are to your advantage and not uh, to uh, others' advantage. Thanks, Omar. Okay. Thanks, Paul. And I, I agree. This is one of those spaces where we are going to see immediate action. If you take a look at the center of the slide, for example, sections 122, that's for the balance of payments deficits. On day one, Donald Trump can impose tariffs of up to 15 percent for 150 days on products coming in from countries that have an underwater balance of payment with the United States under section 122. And Congress can extend that. He can even under 122 block products from coming in under their as well under the 330H, if there's companies that use different measurements, standards, and regulations to discriminate against U.S. companies, Trump can impose tariffs there as well. The safeguards surge is specific under Section 421 to imports from China, but the Trump folks are already making the argument that they don't need to launch a new investigation under Section 301 because one was already conducted, and therefore on day one, they can expand the list of goods subject to a tariff from China and increase the tariff rate for those products that are coming in from, from China, specifically under 301. And to Paul's point on the 232s, we'll continue to see those. Uh, two items, though, on the PNTR, that we are going to continue to hear quite a bit on this, and the most favored nation status that China was granted at their accession in 2000 to the WTO, the, it would take an act of Congress to revoke China's PNTR status. 
based on meetings, the last meeting I had on this was in July or it was in June, it came up. Uh, there just wasn't enough of an appetite on the Hill to get for full PNTR due to the disruption and the backlash from a lot of, a lot of companies and, and importers and retailers. There is though a pathway to be able to get to a maybe return to where we were under Clinton, where it's an annual review where the administration has certified to Congress that China is abiding by the rules, which Trump would do. So there, there's a lot of discussion that's happening there, but the big one that's standing is the USMCA. We've already had multiple meetings and discussions with the US Trade Representative and the Commerce Department and I talked to Commerce last Friday of November 1st, and, and this came up as well with the issue specifically of China shipping goods through Mexico coming into the United States and competing with you all. And more concerning than that is the amount of investment, foreign direct investment by China that's going into Mexico that's leading to operations owned by, Mex by Chinese companies manufacturing in Mexico, often using Chinese tooling, Chinese labor, and being able to ship into the U.S. without having to pay a tariff. So that's one of those areas we do expect some additional, additional action. On day one, tariffs will be very, very active. And this point that we wrote here at the top is that I would, not suge I would suggest folks do not think of tariffs like we had them under the first Trump administration, where they were leverage and a means to an end to bring partners to negotiate with him. I think this time around, we're looking at tariffs being a part of industrial policy unto themselves, meaning they view that tariffs being in place are good for U.S. domestic manufacturing, and that will be a boost to U.S. industry. I'm currently reading Bob Lighthizer's book. I'm on chapter eight right now, getting through that. It's critical to get a better read of what the Trump administration is going to do, because they literally spell it out in a book titled No Trade is Free. But just a reminder for those that have questions to ask, please do type them into the, the question and answer box, and we'll try to work those and incorporate those. The one on 45X, yes, uh, we've got two slides on 45X coming up in the second half of the slide deck. I know we had one hand raised, similar if you don't mind, please type that in here and we'll try to continue and going through it. But no other way area will we be as busy as taxes. So this is where we've spent much of our lobbying time to, to move on and to see uh, some of the issues on is on is going to be on taxes. If in fact the Republicans do have the trifecta, the House of Representatives is part of it, then we are going to be moving through a process called reconciliation. Reconciliation is how Democrats got Obamacare done. Reconciliation is the process by which Trump got the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2017 through. Did not require any Democrats to jump on the tax bill, similar to no Republicans on the health care bill. Republicans would do this again, and they would try to move, at least in the House, in the first 100 days. Uh, maybe. Uh, we'll see if they can get it done in the House by April 15th. I think Memorial Day is probably a little bit more likely, and there's going to be a lot of back and forth on what's actually going to be in in the overall tax bill that they move on. If Congress does nothing, you've heard me say this before, if Congress does nothing by December 31st of 2025, there will be $4.6 trillion in taxes that are raised on all of you and us and everyone else out there because this expiring 199A, the pass-through deduction, for example, that goes away on January 1 of 26. That's a 20% deduction for pass-throughs that we lobbied on your behalf to secure. We have about 64% of One Voice members pay taxes at the individual rate because they are a pass-through entity, and that would be a big hit for them as well. We do know that Trump has talked about lowering the C corporate rate from the rate that he got it down to 21% where it sits today. That's going to be a little bit more difficult. I could see him differentiating between domestic revenue, domestic production activities, for example, and maybe expanding the domestic production activities deduction that we used to have around until Fiske TI. So there's certainly some areas to help domestic manufacturing and incentivize there. But these are going to cost money. The debt ceiling, deficit spending, because Republicans are only going to have a one to four seat majority. I think if we were at Engage, Caitlin and I predicted if they kept the House, they'd be at one to five. It looks like they'll be around two or three seat majority. And in that event, then they're not going to have much leeway to be able to get some of these bills through when some folks are concerned about spending. If Trump gets his way on all taxes, you're looking at maybe five, six or seven trillion dollar worth of tax bill score over 10 years. And so this tax fight is here. It's going to continue to be pushing forward. And this is our number one. This is going to dominate our world here for the foreseeable future. And there's a lot at stake, especially with the trillions of, of tax increases that are on the table that are out there. Again, on taxes, feel free to type in any questions in the Q&A, and we'll be sure to, to bring those up to the end. Let me go back to the uh, to the trade slide. We did have one question that uh, have been there. 
with regards to how do we go about communicating the products on which we would like to see tariffs? Our products have been knocked off by China, and we have seen a subsequent 50% reduction in volume of those products as a result. And that's something that unfortunately we've heard from others as well. Uh, feel free to reach out to me offline and we will double check that those products are currently subject to tariffs. If so, they're likely at 25%, meaning they're gonna be on list one or three uh, from the 301 action. And our argument to the Biden administration and will be to Trump is 25% is nothing. When you're looking at some tooling, you're seeing some other machine products that are coming in from China at a 40 to 70 percent price cut. That is going to be real problematic. My greater concern to the person who asked the question isn't just the goods coming in from China, but to be goods that are manufactured by Chinese with Chinese tooling made in Mexico and shipped into the U.S. And that's a lot harder for us to place a tariff on it. So, yes, we will step one is to confirm. We can certainly point you in that right direction of the docket where we can confirm that a tariff is in place. But I think that is right there as an argument in and of itself why we need to continue our efforts lobbying and pushing the Trump folks to get us a higher tariff that's out there. In the geopolitical sense, this is a slight warning for some of my defense folks that are on here that we talk to on occasion about defense industrial base. We think that Trump will be good for the defense industrial base. Obviously, we have a lot of uh, replenishing and restocking to do, certainly as the, the Biden administration has been working on those efforts as well. But Keep in mind that the Europeans are going to seek to decrease their reliance on the United States, particularly as it relates to defense, industrial base and supplies. And so we do expect an increased investment in European uh, defense suppliers. And that will obviously mean they'll be taking some, not a lot, but some likely away from the U.S. as the Europeans start to look internally as they want to minimize their exposure to Trump and some of the policies that are coming over there. So that's something that we're watching. The other area on, on the slide that we're looking at is going to be on retaliatory tariffs. We've already seen uh, in this in a number of spaces uh, with regards to imports that are coming in from, uh, from overseas and during the Trump administration where tariffs were imposed in an effort to battle some and retaliate against the U.S. under 232s. India did it as well, the Europeans, China. So expect that again, but China's got less exposure. So for example, now Brazil is the largest supplier of soybean into China. It's no longer the United States. And so they've taken steps to minimize some of the retaliatory exposure that they've got, but we do expect that to happen also relatively quickly. And the steel and aluminum, the deal we have with the European Union expires at the end of March, meaning the Europeans in their minds will be free to reinstate $4 trillion worth of tariffs on U.S. goods coming in from there. Congress is returning. This lame duck session is going to be a bit tough. We'll see if they do an extension on government spending by December 20th when the government shut down or they actually do a full funding of the government to clear the decks for Trump. I do believe they will clear the decks for Trump and do get a bill with government spending done in this lame duck. I do not we're feeling less confident about what's going to happen on the uh, on the tax side if we're going to get an R&D and a bonus depreciation fix to at least patch. It does not look like it at this point. It looks like that Senate Republicans are going to want to hang on until they are in charge that's over there. But that concludes that first part. This we're going to do in about seven, 10 minutes. We're trying not to take up too much of your time. But as you know, every month we do like to put out what is the latest that in the regulatory space in particular that we believe that you all should be aware of. And that's what we're going to present here just quickly again for your reference so you can have it. We've had a lot of questions on CMMC. That's the Cybersecurity Maturity Model Certification. This is CMMC. MMC 2.0 is now out for your reference the next four or five slides that will cover what you need to know for those of you that are it have to respond in terms of this. Note that CMMC 2.0 requirements are going to start being included in contracts and the requirements are going to start being effective on December 16th. For those that are not initiated to what this is, this came up at the last days of the Obama administration and began being implemented during Trump where defense contractors and some others are required to have certain cybersecurity provisions and in their shops and certain policies that are there to prevent the obvious. That's the concern is that they're not going to hack into General Electric and steal the, the plane for a plane engine. They're going to hack into one of the NTMA or the PMA members and create vulnerability there. The main key, main key point for you non-defense folks, please don't tune out. We do believe that these types of cybersecurity requirements are coming to you as well, particularly if you have a publicly traded Fortune 150, 100, 500 somewhere in your supply, in your customer base. 
This is the, the simplest of slides for you to take a look at when it comes to CMMC compliance. And keep in mind, I've heard from some of you all like that I see on this call that you've received quotes for anywhere between $100,000 and $300,000 to create a CMMC compliance model that's out there. The main thing that the new and final rule that did and the difference between CMC 1 and 2.0 is they consolidated the number of levels from having five previously to a one, two, and three. And you'll see here that the different uh, items that start to have to require goes under the NIST. We've got the NIST 800 that is going to be in there combining with some of the other requirements as well when you put in self-assessment. Ultimately, the some of the main differences, self-assessment, third party, versus getting the governments. Obviously level three will be the highest that's out there and that's gonna have the requirements of a number of those different provisions that they've been putting out over the last few years. So again, streamlining the models, we've got some more information on compliance on CMMC. They heard from us, we've talked to DOD and told them how this is extremely difficult for compliance. They've told us that it should be an allowable cost for a subprime to build back up. We've talked to them about the difficulties, small businesses, face there as well. But again, who must comply? All DOD contractors and subcontractors that are handling some of the uh, classified and unclassified information that's there as well. Again, prints, think of all of those plans, blueprints, all of these things, even just some email communications about capabilities, all of those information, the controlled unclassified information is one area to be focused on. Again, these will be made available as always for you to, to review and take a look at the different assessments that you've got to do in order to achieve a certain CMC compliance standard as different contracts will have different requirements from the customers that are out there. And you can take a look at the plan of action that is required, what is permitted under the new different levels for CMMC. So we suggest that you've got whoever's handling this in your shop afterwards, please take a look at this and you've got additional compliance resources. We will have that in the webinar registration email that goes out after this with a copy of the slide deck. So we'll make sure that everyone's got that as well. Just finally in our final section here, before we wrap it up again, feel free to ask any questions just on the latest in terms of regulations and rule activity that we receive from the regulators. We expect them to step on the gas quite a bit here in the waning weeks of the Biden administration, especially over at EPA, OSHA, National Labor Relations Board, before there's some changeovers. So we do expect a flurry of activity there. One area in the courts, the a court has blocked the Federal Trade Commission from being able to move forward with their non-compete ban that they wanted to put into place in September 4th. Now the FTC is expected as challenging that non-compete and uh, it also has non-solicitation and non-disclosures that will continue to work its way through that process. But we have also seen now the administration took a look at how they can move forward. NRB is targeting state or pay provisions. I, this one, I, I'm not an attorney. I think a trade lawyer is going to probably need to review some of the agreements that you might have with employees where you have offered to pay for their uh, for sign-on bonuses based on duration of them staying. If you've paid for employees' education, for example, and you've told them they have to repay if they don't stay for a certain amount of time, all of these other quit fees, damaging clauses, rep training, repayments. I do know for a fact some of you have told me you are in some kind of agreement to keep them from going off to the next place after you spend as much as you do to train them. So please, this is one I think probably needs a little bit closer look. It could certainly be overturned by the next administration, but it was done by the general counsel, which is a little bit different. So we wanted to flag that that's out there. This is just annual. We've got more union information and labor practice data has been released as it always is this time of year, but we will certainly see the Biden Trump administration rather try to reverse some of those organizing languages on here. Uh, our Pennsylvania folks, Pittsburgh, I only put this here really so you can see a trend with regards to what's happening in the city of Pittsburgh, prohibit, prohibiting discrimination against employees due to the status of a medical marijuana patient, the banning testing pre and post employment applies to employee employers with five or more employees, something to factor in and how that could spread, especially as you've got now a Trump back in the White House, you're increasingly gonna see certain states bringing up these issues. Hey, California is gonna be a hotbed of lawsuits against the Trump administration, and you're gonna see some other areas there as well. This was one of our questions just about a week ago. We did have 45X final rule uh, come out from the IRS and the Treasury Department. For those that are not aware, under the Inflation Reduction Act that was signed in August of 2022, 
by President Biden, they created a section called 45X. That is the Manufacturing Production Tax Credit, uh, PTC. The Manufacturing Production Tax Credit, though, it's focused on domestic supply chains to do manufacturer critical components and other inputs for energy production. So in order to be eligible, you've got to be in one of those footprints that are out there. Since manufacturers have a good amount of depreciation to reduce your taxable income, there's different tax credits can't be used quick enough. They created the, the 45X that can do a transferability of the, the credits that are there or full to an unrelated uh, taxpayer. So you can receive some, or you can get a, a direct pay where you can request a direct payment of the credit beginning on a certain tax year. And, and then every subsequent some odd years after that, based on what you are able to manufacture for that. So it's for solar energy, for example, uh, eligible components could be panels, cells, solar modules, uh, wafers, some torque tubes, structural fasteners, for example, those could be there for wind energy under 45X. It's blades, towers, uh, fixed to floating platforms, as well, a number of other areas uh, that deal with inverters. And, and so there might be a handful of our members that are, are there as well. But we did want to include on, on the slide and on the next of what they did just do on the IRS coming up with the final regulations that defy the qualifying activities that are out there and for the rules of sales of eligibility for components to unrelated persons. That's the transferability that I had just referenced there as well. So for those of you that are involved in this space and want to take a look at the final definition of eligible components that are there, I encourage you to do so. For example, they do in the Federal Register notice that you can click on here will identify the credit amounts for eligible components for solar energy, for wind energy, for inverters, as I mentioned, and also for qualifying battery components. I did not list them all in here. They are scattered a bit. So if somebody wants some, a little bit more help digging into that, please feel free to to myself or to PMA or NTMA afterwards on the 45X on where they're going. I get this question usually every other month. So we wanted to give you an update on employee retention tax credit. The 400,000 claims uh, being processed that include for eligible and eligible, uh, they're, they're moving quickly. So if you are expecting one, uh, your ERC being processed, then that should be happening hopefully sometime in, in short order. Um, this week, I'm going to include multiple slides, but I'm not going to go through it. Beneficial ownership. This is the requirement under the Corporate Transparency Act that if you have five million or less in sales, or if you have 20 or fewer employees, then you are required by law to submit certain beneficial ownership information to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, FinCEN. And that FinCEN just put out an FAQ on this. The reporting is starting to be due in January 1 of 2025. If you have a new entity that was created this year, I did. I had to file my paperwork within 90 days. If you're creating a new entity starting after January 1 of 25, you got to file your paperwork within 30 days. And if you were pre-existing, such as you all, you have to file by January 1. If again, you are at the five and five million and 20. And the beneficial ownership information that you've got to file will include a copy of a driver's license or a passport, information, DOB, how to contact you, email address, phone numbers, all of those types of issues are going to be included in there, and then they talk about who must file, and that is if you are a senior officer, if you have a general counsel, for example, that would be somebody that exercises substantial control. The other owners, some of you are pastors with a significant number of shareholders. If they exert control or do votes, you might be subject and might be eligible, therefore, or have to deal with that there as well. So on beneficial ownership, they just released their FAQs early last month. And as you can see here, DOB, address, ID number, and if they meet all those other requirements of who must file that's there. So again, if you've got 20 or fewer employees, if you've got $5 million in awards, and in sales rather, then this applies to you on that as well. Taking effect on January 1, this is around the corner. One Voice is lobbying on legislation that would extend it by 12 months, but would not eliminate it in its entirety. As a reminder, feel free to type in any questions on the right-hand side. It's unlikely we will be able to unmute everybody given the number of folks that are on here. Just uh, three or four quick last slides and we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, just to be aware that there is a small business credit initiative that has been coming out and being floated. And so there's additional dollars that are coming out and it's going to the states. And you can see some of the awards, Arizona MEP, uh, manufacturing, Michigan Manufacturing Technology Center, for example, money coming out of, of there as 
well. Uh, we had one question that just came up on beneficial ownership with any chance that this would get replaced. And that's why I emphasize the legislation that is being floated right now is only a one year delay. This was a legislation on Corporate Transparency Act that was done in the waning days of the Trump administration. It was inserted into the defense bill. Trump vetoed the defense bill in uh, 2020, January, but Congress overrode it. And this was tuffed in there. So will it be undone? It's a They look at it as a money laundering, a terrorism and a national security issue is how this got put in there by uh, Carolyn Maloney so many years ago. It's tough for it to get pulled and overdone. That's why lobbying right now is a one-year delay to help small businesses get up to speed on that a little bit. Uh, speak to small businesses. If you do have one of these 401k plans, you did just have your limitation increased just slightly to 23,500. Please be sure that you've got that incorporated. Someone will obviously do that for you. Um, uh, shout out to Jenny Stivica from NTMA, who's in DC a few uh, weeks ago for some of the apprenticeship program work that they're doing with the Department of Labor. Roger was at the White House about a year ago, I think, on this as well. And so they're moving forward with their ambassador outreach programs. They are similar. The Swiss, I used to go to the Swiss Embassy for this event many uh, over many years, and they're continuing their interaction with the United States when it comes to MOUs out there. And then lastly, uh, the tariff process. We've mentioned this before, that the 301 tariff exclusion process is now open. The Biden administration on September 13th announced that they were going to increase tariffs on steel coming in from China and other electric and other vehicle and other components coming in. At the same time, they created a machinery exclusion process where if you are bringing in certain machinery, they've got press brakes on there, there's tooling, there's other items, and you can request the tariff to not have to pay the exclusion, to not have to pay the tariff. That portal is now open. Tariff requests for exclusions are due by May 30, March 31st, but they expire May 31st. We are looking at this every single day. If anybody is going to be filing a request for a certain product that one of our One Voice members makes, we intend to launch a campaign to oppose that in order to maintain the tariff on those products. And you can see here, this is a snapshot of the portal where we've got the temporary exclusions for machinery used in domestic manufacturing. And then lastly, the Biden administration did finalize their outbound investment rule that restricts what can be sent over and how can be invested in China in their efforts to restrict that. Similar, and then last on the CFIUS, more real estate around bases are gonna be subject to review and purchases. So we expect all of that to be continued under a Trump administration to go in hyperdrive, certainly on China issues. And you can get more of this from our podcast. We just recorded one yesterday, which hopefully should be live some point today in your podcast feeds. We encourage you to check that out. And as always, any support you can provide for the trade associations is appreciated. Um, with that, happy to take any questions that we did not already answer. It looks like we've got a few of them in there. I know we went double the time that we have allotted for this typically appreciate your patience a lot to cover with the election and out there so hopefully everyone felt it was worthwhile to get both the election the policy and the normal slide deck here as well uh, as always this slide deck will be made available and will be sent out to all participants usually the next few hours so sometime today friday afternoon you should be receiving that as always please reach out to any one of us for any questions that you may have uh, i'll give folks maybe about another 15 20 seconds and not seeing anybody typing anything in over on the right hand side uh, please, please do so. Otherwise, like we said, we've got quite a bit. We're doing our next webinar. Uh, it's going to be, I believe, that first Friday in, in December. So that might be around December 5th or so, wherever that falls in. December 6th uh, is going to be our next webinar at noon Eastern that day. Seeing no further questions come in, thank you all for joining us today and your patience on a longer slide. Uh, congrats on getting through election week and election year. And we look forward to the next one. And we'll talk to you in a month. Thank you all.